Hello and welcome to what is, if I'm keeping count of these things correctly, part four of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, this is the point at which uh, a disembodied voice should say, previously on Frankenstein. Uh, part three saw the creature's birth. Uh, Victor at university in Ingolstadt. The birth of the creature, the first confrontation between the creature and Frankenstein. The creature fleeing. Uh, Henry Clerval, Victor Frankenstein's best friend, arriving in Ingolstadt. Frankenstein's collapse and uh, illness, nervous breakdown really, I think. His recovery and at the end of part three, Clerval had uh, just pre presented him with a letter from uh, the, the woman he calls his cousin, who of course isn't really his cousin. She was adopted into uh, the Frankenstein family. Um, and that is uh, Elizabeth and Clerval. Uh, given that uh, Frankenstein has now been much better for a few days, has decided that uh, um, it's OK for Frankenstein to read the letter. And that's where we will begin. The usual reminder that uh, this is a live recording. Uh, no retakes, no edits, so it is what it is. Noise is off, or me making mistakes. Uh, we will deal with as best we can. Part four of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Cleval then put the following letter into my hands. It was from my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been ill, very ill, and even the constant letters of dear kind Henry are not sufficient to reassure me on your account. You are forbidden to write, to hold a pen, yet one word from you, dear Victor, is necessary to calm our apprehensions. For a long time I have thought that each post would bring this line, and my persuasions have restrained my uncle from undertaking a journey to Ingolstadt. I have prevented his encountering the inconveniences and perhaps the dangers of so long a journey, yet how often have I regretted not being able to perform it myself. I figure to myself that the task of attending on your sick bed has devolved on some mercenary old nurse who could never guess your wishes, nor minister to them with the care and affection of your poor cousin. Yet that is over now. Clerval writes that indeed you are getting better. I eagerly hope that you will confirm this intelligence soon in your own handwriting. Get well and return to us. You will find a happy, cheerful home and friends who love you dearly. Your father's health is vigorous and he asks but to see you, but to be assured that you are well and not a care will ever cloud his benevolent countenance. How pleased you would be to remark the improvement of our Ernest. He is now sixteen and full of activity and spirit. He is desirous to be a true Swiss and to enter into foreign service, but we cannot part with him, at least until his elder brother returns to us. My uncle is not pleased with the idea of a military career in a distant country, but Ernest never had your powers of application. He looks upon study as an odious fetter. His time is spent in the open air, climbing the hills or rowing on the lake. I fear that he will become an idler unless we yield the point and permit him to enter on the profession which he has selected. Little alteration except the growth of our dear children has taken place since you left us. The Blue Lake and snow-clad mountains, they never change. And I think our placid home and our contented hearts are regulated by the same immutable laws. My trifling occupations take up my time and amuse me, and I am rewarded for any exertions by seeing none but happy, kind faces around me. Since you left us, but one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasions Justine Moritz entered our family? 
Probably you do not. I will relate her history, therefore, in a few words. Madame Moritz, her mother, was a widow with four children, of whom Justine was the third. This girl had always been the favourite of her father, but through a strange perversity her mother could not endure her, and after the death of Monsieur Moritz, treated her very ill. My aunt observed this, and when Justine was twelve years of age, prevailed on her mother to allow her to live at our house. The republican institutions of our country have produced simpler and happier manners than those which prevail in the great monarchies that surround it. Hence there is less distinction between the several classes of its inhabitants, than the lower orders being neither so poor nor so despised, their manners are more refined and moral. A servant in Geneva does not mean the same thing as a servant in France and England. Justine, thus received in our family, learned the duties of a servant, a condition which, in our fortunate country, does not include the idea of ignorance and a sacrifice of the dignity of a human being. Justine, you may remember, was a great favourite of yours, and I recollect you once remarked that if you were in an ill humour, one glance from Justine could dissipate it, for the same reason that Ariosto gives concerning the beauty of Angelica. She looked so frank-hearted and happy. My aunt conceived a great attachment for her, by which she was induced to give her an education superior to that which she had at first intended. This benefit was fully repaid. Justine was the most grateful little creature in the world. I do not mean that she made any professions. I never heard one pass her lips, but you could see by her eyes that she almost adored her protectress. Although her disposition was gay and in many respects inconsiderate, yet she paid the greatest attention to every gesture of my aunt. She thought her the model of all excellence and endeavoured to imitate her phraseology and manners, so that even now she often reminds me of her. When my dearest aunt died, everyone was too much occupied in their own grief to notice poor Justine, who had attended her illness with the most anxious affection. Poor Justine was very ill, but other trials were reserved for her. One by one, her brothers and sisters died, and her mother, with the exception of her neglect. I'm sorry. One by one, her brothers and sisters died, and her mother, with the exception of her neglected daughter, was left childless. The conscience of the woman was troubled. She began to think that the deaths of her favourites were a, just, a judgment from heaven to chastise her partiality. She was a Roman Catholic and I believe her confessor confirmed the idea which she had conceived. Accordingly, a few months after your departure for Ingolstadt, Justine was called home by her repentant mother. Poor girl! She wept when she quitted our house. She was much altered since the death of my aunt. Grief had given softness and a winning mildness to, mildness to her manners, which had before been remarkable for vivacity nor was her residence at her mother's house, of a nature to restore her gaiety. The poor woman was very vacillating in her repentance. She sometimes begged Justine to forgive her unkindness, but much oftener, her, but much oftener accused her of having caused the deaths of her brother and sister. Brothers and sisters. Perpetual fretting at length drew Madame Moritz into a decline which at first increased her irritability, but she is now at peace forever. She died on the first approach of cold weather at the beginning of this last winter. Justine has just returned to us, and I assure you I love her tenderly. She is very clever and gentle, and extremely pretty, and as I mentioned before, her mien and her expressions continually remind me of my dear aunt. I must say also a few words to you, my dear cousin, of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall of his age, with sweet, laughing blue eyes, dark eyelashes and curling hair. 
When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. He has already had one or two little wives, but Louise Biron is his favourite, a pretty little girl of five years of age. Now, dear Victor, I dare say you wish to be indulged in a little gossip concerning the good people of Geneva. The pretty Miss Mansfield has already received the congratulatory visits on her approaching marriage with a young Englishman, John Melbourne, Esquire. Her ugly sister Manon married Monsieur Duviard, the rich banker, last autumn. Your favourite schoolfellow, Louis Manoir, has suffered misfortunes since the departure of Clerval from Geneva. But he has already recovered his spirits and is reported to be on the point of marrying a very lively, pretty French woman, Madame Tavernier. She is a widow and much older than Manoir, but she is very much admired and a favourite with everybody. I have written myself into better spirits, dear cousin, but my anxiety returns upon me as I conclude. Right, dearest Victor, one line, one word will be a blessing to us. Ten thousand thanks to Henry for his kindness, his affection and his many letters. We are sincerely grateful. Adieu, my cousin. Take care of yourself. And I entreat you. Write. Elizabeth Lavenza, Geneva, March 18th. Oh, dear, dear Elizabeth, I exclaimed when I had read her letter. I will write instantly and relieve them from the anxiety they must feel. I wrote, and this exertion greatly fatigued me, but my convalescence had commenced and proceeded regularly. In another fortnight I was able to leave my chamber. One of my first duties on my recovery was to introduce Clerval to the several professors of the university. In doing this, I underwent a kind of rough usage, ill befitting the wounds that my mind had sustained. Ever since the fatal night, the end of my labours and the beginning of my misfortunes, I had conceived a violent antipathy even to the name of natural philosophy. When I was otherwise quite restored to health, the sight of a chemical instrument would renew all the agony of my nervous symptoms. Henry saw this and re had removed all my apparatus from my view. He had also changed my apartment, for he perceived that I had acquired a dislike for the room which had previously been my laboratory. But these cares of Clerval were made of no avail when I visited the professors. Monsieur Waldman inflicted torture when he praised with kindness and warmth the astonishing progress I had made in the sciences. He soon perceived that I disliked the subject, but not guessing the real cause, he attributed my feelings to modesty and changed the subject from my improvement to the science itself, with a desire, as I evidently saw, of drawing me out. And what could I do? He meant to please and he tormented me. I felt as if he had placed carefully, one by one, in my view, those instruments which were to be afterwards used in putting me to a slow and cruel death. I writhed under his words, yet dared not exhibit the pain I felt. Clerval, whose eyes and feelings were always quick in discerning the sensations of others, declined the subject, alleging in excuse his total ignorance and the conversation took a more general turn. I thanked my friend from my heart, but I did not speak. I saw plainly that he was surprised, but he never attempted to draw my secret from me, and although I loved him with a mixture of affection and reverence that knew no bounds, yet I could never persuade myself to confide in him that event which was so often present in my recollection but which I feared the detail to another would only impress more, de more deeply. Monsieur Kremper was not equally docile, and in my condition at that time of almost insupportable sensi sensitiveness, his harsh, blunt encomiums gave me even more pain than the benevolent approbation of Monsieur Waldman. 
Damn that fellow, cried he. Why, Monsieur Claval, I assure you he has outstripped us all. Ay, stare if you please, but it is nevertheless true. A youngster who but a few years ago believed in Cornelius Agrippa as firmly as in the gospel has now set himself as the head of the university, and if he is not soon pulled down, we shall all be out of countenance. Ay, ay, continued he, observing my face expressive of suffering. Monsieur Frankenstein is modest and excellent quality in a young man. Young men should be diffident of themselves, you know, Monsieur Clerval. I was myself when young, but that wears out in a very short time. Monsieur Cramper had now commenced a eulogy on himself, which happily turned the conversation from a subject that was so annoying to me. Clerval had never sympathised in my tastes for natural science, and his literary pursuits differed wholly from those which had occupied me. He came to the university with the, with the design of making himself complete master of the Oriental languages, as thus he should open a field for the plan of life he had marked out for himself. Resolved to pursue no inglorious career, he turned his eyes toward the east as affording scope for his spirit of enterprise. The Persian, Arabic and Sanskrit languages engaged his attention, and I was easily induced to enter on the same studies. Idleness had ever been irksome to me, and now that I wished to fly from reflection and hated my former studies, I felt great relief in being the fellow pupil with my friend, and found not only instruction, but consolation in the works of the Orientalists. I did not, like him, attempt a critical knowledge of their dialects, for I did not contemplate making any other use of them than temporary amusement. I read merely to understand their meaning, and they well repaid my labours. Their melancholy is soothing, and their joy elevating, to a degree I never experienced in studying the authors of any other country. There, I, when you read their writings, life appears to consist in a warm sun and a garden of roses, in the smiles and frowns of a fair enemy, and the fire that consumes your own heart. How different from the manly and heroical poetry of Greece and Rome. Summer passed away in these occupations, and my return to Geneva was fixed for the latter end of autumn. But being delayed by several accidents, winter and snow arrived. The roads were deemed impassable, and my journey was retarded until the ensuing spring. I felt this delay very bitterly, for I longed to see my native town and my beloved friends. My return had only been delayed so long from an unwillingness to leave Clerval in a strange place before he had become acquainted with any of its inhabitants. The winter, however, was spent cheerfully, and although the spring was uncommonly late, when it came, its beauty compensated for its dilatoriness. The month of May had already commenced, and I expected the letter daily which was to fix the date of my departure. When Henry proposed a pedestrian tour, in the environs of Ingolstadt, that I might bid a personal farewell to the country I had so long inhabited. I acceded with pleasure to this proposition. I was fond of exercise, and Clerval had always been my favourite companion in the rambles of this nature that I had taken among the scenes of my native country. We passed a fortnight in these perambulations, my health and spirits had long been restored, and they gained additional strength from the salubrious air I breathed, the natural incidents of our progress, and the conversation of my friend. Study had before secluded me from the intercourse of my fellow creatures, and rendered me unsocial. But Clerval called forth the better feelings of my heart. He again taught me to love the aspect of nature, and the cheerful faces of children. Excellent friend, how sincerely did you love me and endeavour to elevate my mind until it was on a level with your own? A selfish pursuit had cramped and narrowed me. 
until your gentleness and affection warmed and opened my senses. I became the same happy creature who a few years ago, loved and beloved by all, had no sorrow or care. When happy, inanimate nature had the power of bestowing on me the most delightful sensations. A serene sky and verdant fields filled me with ecstasy. And the present season was, indeed, divine. The flowers of spring bloomed in the hedges while those of summer were already in bud. I was undisturbed by thoughts which during the preceding year had pressed upon me, notwithstanding my endeavours to throw them off with an invincible burden. Henry rejoiced in my gaiety and sincerely sympathised in my feelings. He exerted himself to amuse me while he expressed the sensations that filled his soul. The resources of his mind on this occasion were truly astonishing. His conversation was full of imagination, and very often, in imitation of the Persian and Arabic writers, he invented tales of wonderful fancy and passion. At other times, he repeated my favourite poems, or drew me out into arguments which he supported with great ingenuity. We returned to our college on a Sunday afternoon. The peasants were dancing and everyone we met appeared gay and happy. My own spirits were high and I bounded along with feelings of unbridled joy and hilarity. On my return, I found the following letter from my father. My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return to us. And I was at first tempted to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you. But that would be a cruel kindness, and I dare not do it. What would be your surprise, my son, when you expect a happy and glad welcome to behold, on the contrary, tears and wretchedness? And how, Victor, can I relate our misfortune? Absence cannot have rendered you callous to our joys and griefs, and how shall I inflict pain on my long-absent son? I wish to prepare you for the woeful news, but I know it is impossible. Even now your eye skims over the page to seek the words which are to convey to you the horrible tidings. William is dead. That sweet child, whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, who was so gentle yet so gay, Victor, he is murdered. I will not attempt to console you, but will simply relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, May the 7th, I, my niece and your two brothers went to walk in Plain Palais. The evening was warm and serene and we prolonged our walk farther than usual. It was already dusk before we thought of returning and then we discovered that William and Ernest, who had gone on before, were not to be found. We accordingly rested on a seat until they should return. Presently Ernest came and inquired if we had seen his brother. He said that he had been playing with him, that William had run away to hide himself, and that he vainly sought for him and afterwards waited for him a long time, but he did not return. This account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him until night fell, when Elizabeth conjectured that he might have returned to the house. He was not there. We returned again with torches, for I could not rest when I thought that my sweet boy had lost himself and was exposed to all the damps and dews of night. Elizabeth also suffered extreme anguish. About five in the morning I discovered my lovely boy 
whom the night before I had seen blooming and active in health, stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murderer's finger was on his neck. He was conveyed home, and the anguish that was visible in my countenance betrayed the secret to Elizabeth. She was very earnest to see the corpse. At first I attempted to prevent her, but she persisted, and entering the room where it lay, hastily examined the neck of the victim, and clasping her hands exclaimed, O oh God, I have murdered my darling child. She fainted, and was restored with extreme difficulty. And when she again lived, it was only to weep and sigh. She told me that that same evening William had teased her to let him wear a very valuable miniature that she possessed of your mother. This picture is gone, and was doubtless the temptation which urged the murderer to the deed. We have no trace of him at present, although our exertions to discover him are unremitted. But they will not restore my Dear William, come, dearest Victor, you alone can console Elizabeth. She weeps continually and accuses herself unjustly as the cause of his death. Her words pierce my heart. We are all unhappy, but will not that be an additional motive for you, my son, to return and be our comforter? Your dear mother... Alas, Victor, I now say thank God she did not live to witness the cruel, miserable death of her youngest darling. Come, Victor, not brooding thoughts of vengeance against the assassin, but with feelings of peace and gentleness that will heal instead of festering the wounds of our mind. Enter the house of mourning, my friend, but with kindness and affection for those who love you and not with hatred for your enemies. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein, Geneva, May 12th. Claval, who had watched my countenance as I read this letter, was surprised to observe the despair that succeeded the joy I at first expressed on receiving news from my friends. I threw the letter on the table and covered my face with my hands. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed Henry, when he perceived me weep with bitterness. Are you always to be unhappy? My dear friend, what has happened? I motioned to him to take up the letter while I walked up and down the room. Excuse me. I motioned him to take up the letter while I walked up and down the room in the extremest agitation. Tears also gushed from the eyes of Clerval as he read the account of my misfortune. I can offer you no consolation, my friend, said he. Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do? Would to go instantly to Geneva, I said. Come with me, Henry, to order the horses. During our walk, Claval endeavoured to say a few words of consolation. He could only express his heartfelt sympathy. Poor William, said he, dear, lovely child. He now sleeps with his angel mother. Who that had seen him bright and joyous in his young beauty but must weep over his untimely loss to die so miserably to feel the murderer's grasp how much more a murderer that could destroy such radiant innocence poor little fellow one only consolation have we his friends mourn and weep but he is at rest the pang is over his sufferings are at an end for ever. A sod covers his gentle form, and he knows no pain. He can no longer be a subject for pity. We must reserve that 
for his miserable survivors. Laval spoke thus as we hurried through the streets. The words impressed myself on my mind and I remembered them afterwards in solitude. But now, as soon as the horses arrived, I hurried into a cabriolet and bade farewell to my friend. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, for I longed to console and sympathise with my beloved and sorrowing friends, but when I drew near my native town I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind. I passed through scenes familiar to my youth, but which I had not seen for nearly six years. How altered everything might be during that time! One sudden and desolating change had taken place, but a thousand little circumstances might have by degrees worked other alterations, which, although they were done more tranquilly, might not be the less decisive. Fear overcame me. I dared no advance, although I was unable to define them. I remained two days at Lausanne in this painful state of mind contemplated the lake. The waters were placid, all around was calm, and the snowy mountains, the palaces of nature, were not changed. By degrees the calm and heavenly scene restored me. And I continued my journey towards Geneva. The road ran by the side of the lake, which became narrower as I approached my native town. I discovered more distinctly the black sides of Jura and the bright summit of Mont Blanc. I wept like a child. Dear mountains, my own beautiful lake, how do you welcome your wanderer? Your summits are clear, the sky and lake are blue and placid. Is this to prognosticate peace or to mock at my unhappiness? I fear, my friend, that I shall render myself tedious by dwelling on these preliminary circumstances, but they were days of comparative happiness, and I think of them with pleasure. My country, my beloved country, who but a native can tell the delight I took in again beholding the streams, the mountains, and more than all, the lovely lake. Yet as I drew nearer home, grief and fear again overcame me. Night also closed around, and when I could hardly see the dark mountains, I felt still more gloomily. The picture appeared a vast and dim scene of evil, and I foresaw obscurely that I was destined to become the most wretched of human beings. Alas, I prophesied truly and failed only in one single circumstance— that in all the misery I imagined and dreaded, I did not conceive the hundredth part of the anguish I was destined to endure. It was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva. The gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to pass the night at Secheron, a village at the distance of half a league from the city. The sky was serene, and as I was unable to rest, I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. As I could not pass through the town, I was obliged to cross the lake in a boat to arrive at Plan Palais. During this short voyage, I saw the lightning playing on the summit of Mont Blanc in the most beautiful figures. The storm appeared to approach rapidly, and on landing... I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress. It advanced. The heavens were clouded, and I soon felt the rain coming slowly in large drops, but its violence quickly increased. I quitted my seat and walked on, although the darkness and storm increased every minute, and the thunder burst with a terrible crash over my head. It was echoed from Selev, the Juras, and the Alps of Savoy. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. 
Then, for an instant, everything seemed of a pitchy darkness until the eye recovered itself from the preceding flash. The storm, as is often the case in Switzerland, appeared at once in various parts of the heavens. The most violent storm hung exactly north of the town, over that part of the lake which lies between the promontory of Belle Reve and the village of Copay. Another storm enlightened Jura with faint flashes, and another darkened and sometimes disclosed the Mole, a peaked mountain to the east of the lake. While I watched the tempest, so beautiful and yet terrific, I wandered on with a hasty step. The noble war in the sky elevated my spirits. I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this thy dirge. As I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me, its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspects, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. What did he there? Could he be... I shuddered at the conception. The murderer of my brother? No sooner did that idea cross my imagination than I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered, and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly, and I lost it in the gloom. Nothing in human shape could have destroyed that fair child. He was the murderer. I could not doubt it. The mere presence of the idea was an irresistible proof of the fact. I thought of pursuing the devil, but it would have been in vain, for another flash discovered him to me, hanging among the rocks of the nearly perpendicular ascent of Mont Celebre, a hill that bounds Plan Palais on the south. He soon, reached, he soon reached the summit and disappeared. I remained motionless. The thunder ceased, but the rain still continued, and the scene was enveloped in an impenetrable darkness. I revolved in my mind the events which I had until now sought to forget, the whole train of my progress towards the creation, the appearance of the works of my own hands alive at my bedside, its departure. Two years had now elapsed since the night on which he first received life, and was this his first crime? Alas, I had turned loose into the world a depraved wretch whose delight was in carnage and misery. Had he not murdered my brother? No one can conceive the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night, which I spent cold and wet in the open air. But I did not feel the inconvenience of the weather. My imagination was busy in scenes of evil and despair. I considered the being whom I had cast among mankind and endowed with the will and power to effect purposes of horror, such as the deed which he had now done. Nearly in the light of my own vampire, my own spirit let loose from the grave and forced to destroy all that was dear to me. Day dawned, and I directed my steps towards the town. The gates were open, and I hastened to my father's house. My first thought was to discover what I knew of the murderer, and cause instant pursuit to be made. And I paused when I reflected on the story that I had to tell. A being, whom I myself had formed, and endued with life, had met me at midnight among the precipices of an inaccessible mountain. I remembered also the nervous fever with which I had been seized, just at the time that I dated my creation, and which would give an air of delirium to a tale otherwise so utterly improbable. 
I well knew that if any other had communicated such a relation to me, I should have looked upon it as the ravings of insanity. Besides, the strange nature of the animal would elude all pursuit, even if I was so far credited as to persuade my relatives to commence it. And then of what use would be pursuit? Who could arrest a creature capable of scaling the overhanging sides of Mont Salève? These reflections determined me, and I resolved to remain silent. It was about five in the morning when I entered my father's house. I told the servants not to disturb the family and went into the library to attend their usual hour of rising. Six years had elapsed, passed in a dream but for one indelible trace, and I stood in the same place where I had last embraced my father before my departure for Ingolstadt. Beloved and venerable parent, he still remained to me. I gazed on the picture of my mother, which stood over the mantelpiece. It was an historical subject, painted at my father's desire, and represented Caroline Beaufort in an agony of despair, kneeling by the coffin of her dead father. Her garb was rustic, and her cheek pale. But there was an air of dignity and beauty that hardly permitted the sentiment of pity. Below this picture was a miniature of William, and my tears flowed when I looked upon it. While I was thus engaged, Ernest entered. He had heard me arrive, and hastened to welcome me. He expressed a sorrowful delight to see me. "'Welcome, my dearest Victor,' said he. "'Ah, oh, I wish you had come three months ago, and then you would have found us all joyous and delighted.' You come to us now to share a misery which nothing can alleviate. Yet your presence will, I hope, revive our father who seems sinking under his misfortune. And your persuasions will induce poor Elizabeth to cease her vain and tormenting self-accusations. Oh, poor William, he was our darling and our pride. Tears unrestrained fell from my brother's eyes. A sense of mortal agony crept over my frame. Before, I had only imagined the wretchedness of my desolated home. The reality came on me as a new and a not less terrible disaster. I tried to calm Ernest. I inquired more minutely concerning my father and her I named my cousin. She most of all, said Ernest, requires consolation. She accused herself of having caused the death of my brother, and that made her very wretched. But since the murderer has been discovered... The murderer discovered? I exclaimed. Good God, how can that be? Who could attempt to pursue him? It is impossible. One might as well try to overtake the winds, or confine a mountain stream with a straw. I saw him too. He was free last night. I do not know what you mean, replied my brother, in accents of wonder. But to us the discovery we have made completes our misery. No one would believe it at first. And even now Elizabeth will not be convinced, notwithstanding all the evidence. Indeed, who could credit that Justine Moritz, who was so amiable and fond of all the family could suddenly become so capable of so frightful, so appalling a crime. Justine Moritz, I said. Poor, poor girl, is she the accused? But it is wrongfully. Everyone knows that. No one believes it, surely, Ernest. No one did at first, he said. But several circumstances came out that have almost forced conviction upon us and her own behaviour has been so confused as to add the evidence of facts a weight that I fear leaves no hope for doubt. But she will be tried today, and you will then hear all. He related that the morning on which the murder of poor William had been discovered, Justine had been taken ill and confined to her bed for several days, 
During this interval, one of the servants, happening to examine the apparel she had worn on the night of the murder, had discovered in her pocket the picture of my mother, which had been judged to be the temptation of the murderer. The servant instantly showed it to one of the others, who, without saying a word to any of the family, went to a magistrate, and upon their deposition Justine was apprehended. On being charged with the fact, the poor girl confirmed the suspicion in a great measure by her extreme confusion of manner. This was a strange tale, but it did not shake my faith, and I replied earnestly, You are all mistaken. I know the murderer. Justine? Poor good Justine is innocent. At that instant, my father entered. I saw unhappiness deeply impressed on his countenance, but he endeavoured to welcome me cheerfully, and after we had exchanged our mournful greeting, would have introduced some other topic than that of our disaster, had not Ernest exclaimed, Good God, Papa, Victor says that he knows who was the murderer of poor William. We do also, unfortunately, replied my father, for indeed... I had rather have been for ever ignorant than have discovered so much depravity and ingratitude in one I valued so highly. My dear father, I said, you are mistaken. Justine is innocent. If she is, my father said, God forbid that she should suffer as guilty. She is to be tried today, and I hope... I sincerely hope that she will be acquitted. This speech calmed me. I was firmly convinced in my own mind that Justine, and indeed every human being, was guiltless of this murder. I had no fear, therefore, that any circumstantial evidence could be brought forward strong enough to convict her. My tale was not one to announce publicly. Its astounding horror would be looked upon as madness by the vulgar. Did any one indeed exist, except I, the Creator, who would believe, unless his senses convinced him, in the existence of the living monument of presumption and rash ignorance which I had let loose upon the world? We were soon joined by Elizabeth. Time had altered her since I last beheld her. It had endowed her with loveliness surpassing the beauty of her childish years. There was the same candour, the same vivacity, but it was allied to an expression more full of sensibility and intellect. She welcomed me with the greatest affection. Your arrival, dear cousin, said she, fills me with hope. You perhaps will find some means to justify my poor guiltless Justine. Alas, who is safe if she be convicted of crime? I rely on her innocence as certainly as I do upon my own. Our misfortune is doubly hard to us. We have not only lost that lovely darling boy, but this poor girl, whom I sincerely love, is to be torn away by even a worse fate. If she is condemned, I shall never know joy more. But she will not. I am sure she will not. And then I shall be happy again, even after the sad death of my little William. She is innocent, my Elizabeth, said I. And that shall be proved. Fear nothing. But let your spirits be cheered by the assurance of her acquittal. How kind and generous you are, said Elizabeth. Everyone else believes in her guilt, and that made me wretched, for I knew that it was impossible. And to see everyone else prejudiced in so deadly a manner rendered me hopeless and despairing. She wept. Dearest niece, dearest niece, said my father, dry your tears. If she is, as you believe, innocent, Rely on the justice of our laws and the activity with which I shall prevent the slightest shadow of partiality.
we passed a few sad hours until eleven o'clock when the trial was to commence. My father and the rest of the family being obliged to attend as witnesses, I accompanied them to the court. During the whole of this wretched mockery of justice, I suffered living torture. It was to be decided whether the result of my curiosity and lawless devices would cause the death of my fellow beings. One, a smiling babe full of innocence and joy, the other far more dreadfully murdered, with every aggravation of infamy that could make the murder memorable in horror. Justine also was a girl of merit and possessed qualities which promised to render her life happy. Now all was to be obliterated in an ignominious grave, and I, the cause, a thousand times rather would I have confessed myself guilty of the crime ascribed to Justine. But I was absent when it was committed, and such a declaration would have been considered as the ravings of a madman, and would not have exculpated her who suffered through me. The appearance of Justine was calm. She was dressed in mourning, and her countenance, always engaging, was rendered by the solemnity of her feelings exquisitely beautiful. Yet she appeared confidence in innocence and did not tremble, although gazed on and execrated by thousands for all the kindness which her beauty might otherwise have excited was obliterated in the minds of the spectators by the imagination of the enormity she was supposed to have committed. She was tranquil, yet her tranquillity was evidently constrained, and as her confusion had before been adduced as a proof of her guilt, she worked up her mind to an appearance of courage. When she entered the court, she threw her eyes round it, and quickly discovered where we were seated. A tear seemed to dim her eye when she saw us, but she quickly recovered herself, and a look of sorrowful affection seemed to attest her utter guiltlessness. The trial began, and after the advocate again, and after the advocate against her had stated the charge, several witnesses were called, several strange facts combined against her, which might have staggered anyone who had not such proof of her innocence as I had. She had been out the whole of the night on which the murder had been committed, and towards morning had been perceived by a market woman not far from the spot where the body of the murdered child had been afterwards found. The woman asked her what she did there, but she looked very strangely and only returned a confused and unintelligible answer. She returned to the house about eight o'clock, and when one inquired where she had passed the night, she replied that she had been looking for the child, and demanded earnestly if anything had been heard concerning him. When shown the body, she fell into violent hysterics, and kept her bed for several days. The picture was then produced, which the servant had found in her pocket, and when Elizabeth, in a faltering voice, proved that it was the same which an hour before the child had been missed, she had placed around his neck, a murmur of horror and indignation filled the court. Justine was called on for her defence. As the trial proceeded, her countenance had altered. Surprise, horror and misery were strongly expressed. Sometimes she struggled with her tears, but when she was desired to plead, she collected her powers and spoke in an audible although variable voice. God knows, she said, how entirely I am innocent, but I do not pretend that my protestations should acquit me. I rest my innocence on a plain and simple explanation of the facts which have been adduced against me, and I hope the character I have always borne will incline my judges to a favourable interpretation, where any circumstance appears doubtful or suspicious.
She then related that by the permission of Elizabeth she had passed the evening of the night on which the murder had been committed at the house of an aunt at Shen, a village situated at about a league from Geneva. On her return, at about nine o'clock, she met a man who asked her if she had seen anything of the child who was lost. She was alarmed by this account and passed several hours in looking for him when the gates of Geneva was, were shut and she was forced to remain several hours of the night in a barn belonging to a cottage, being unwilling to call up the inhabitants to whom she was well known. Most of the night she spent here, watching. Towards morning she believed that she slept for a few minutes. Some steps disturbed her and she awoke. It was dawn, and she quitted her asylum that she might again endeavour to find my brother. If she had gone near the spot where his body lay, it was without her knowledge. That she had been bewildered when questioned by the market woman was not surprising, since she had passed a sleepless night and the fate of poor William was yet uncertain. Concerning the picture, she could give no account. I know, continued the unhappy victim, how heavily and fatally this one circumstance weighs against me, but I have no power of explaining it, and when I have expressed my utter ignorance I am only left to conjecture concerning the probabilities by which it might have been placed in my pocket. But here also I am checked. I believe that I have no enemy on earth, and none surely would have been so wicked as to destroy me wantonly. Did the murderer place it there? I know of no opportunity afforded him for so doing, or if I had, why should he have stolen the jewel, to part with it again so soon? I commit my cause to the justice of my judges, yet I see no room for hope. I beg permission to have a few witnesses examined concerning my character, and if their testimony shall not overweigh my supposed guilt, I must be condemned, although I would pledge my salvation on my innocence. Several witnesses were called who had known her for many years, and they spoke well of her, but fear and Hatred of the crime which they supposed her guilty rendered them timorous and unwilling to come forward. Elizabeth saw even this last resource, her excellent dispositions and irreproachable conduct, about to fail the accused, when, although violently agitated, she desired permission to address the court. I am, she said, the cousin of the unhappy child who was murdered, or rather his sister, for I was educated by and have lived with his parents ever since and even long before his birth. It may therefore be judged indecent in me to come forward on this occasion, but when I see a fellow creature about to perish through the cowardice of her pretended friends, I wish to be allowed to speak, that I may say what I know of her character. I am well acquainted with the accused. I have lived in the same house with her, at one time for five and at another time for nearly two years. During all that period, she appeared to me the most amiable and benevolent of human creatures. She nursed Madame Frankenstein, my aunt, in her last illness with the greatest affection and care, and afterwards attended her own mother during a tedious illness in a manner that excited the admiration of all who knew her, after which she again lived in my uncle's house, where she was beloved by all the family. She was warmly attached to the child who is now dead, and acted towards him like a most affectionate mother. For my own part, I do not hesitate to say that notwithstanding all the evidence produced against her, I believe and rely on her perfect innocence. She had no temptation for such an action. As to the bauble on which the chief proof rests, 
if she had earnestly desired it, I should have willingly given it to her. So much do I esteem and value her. A murmur of approbation followed Elizabeth's simple and powerful appeal, but it was excited by her generous interference and not in favour of poor Justine, on whom the public indignation was turned with renewed violence, charging her with the blackest ingratitude. She herself wept as Elizabeth spoke, but she did not answer. My own agitation and anguish was extreme during the whole trial. I believed in her innocence. I knew it. Could the demon who had, I did not for a minute doubt, my... Could the demon who had, I did not for a minute doubt, murdered my brother, also in his hellish sport, have betrayed the innocence to death and ignominy? I could not sustain the horror of my situation, and when I perceived that the popular voice and the countenances of the judges had already condemned my unhappy victim, I rushed out of the court in agony. The tortures of the accused did not equal mine. She was sustained by innocence, but the fangs of remorse tore my bosom and would not forego their hold. I passed a night of unmingled wretchedness. In the morning I went to the court. My lips and throat were parched. I dare not ask the fatal question, but I was known, and the officer guessed the cause of my visit. The ballots had been thrown. They were all black, and Justine was condemned. I cannot pretend to describe what I then felt. I had before experienced sensations of horror, and I have endeavoured to bestow upon them adequate expressions, but words cannot convey an idea of the heart-sickening despair that I then endured. The person to whom I addressed myself added that Justine had already confessed her guilt. That evidence, he observed, was hardly required in so glaring a case, but I am glad of it, and indeed... None of our judges like to condemn a criminal upon circumstantial evidence, be it ever so decisive. This was strange and unexpected intelligence. What could it mean? Had my eyes deceived me? And was I really as mad as the whole world would believe me to be if I disclosed the object of my suspicions? I hastened to return home, and Elizabeth eagerly demanded the result. My cousin, replied I, it is decided as you may have expected. All judges had rather that ten innocent should suffer than that one guilty should escape. But she has confessed. This was a dire blow to poor Elizabeth, who had relied with firmness upon Justine's innocence. Alas, said she, how shall I ever again believe in human goodness. Justine, whom I loved and esteemed as my sister, how could she put on those smiles of innocence only to betray? Her mild eyes seemed incapable of any severity or guile, and yet she has committed a murder. Soon after we heard that the poor victim had expressed a desire to see my cousin. My father wished her not to go, but said that he left it to her own judgment and feelings to decide. Yes, said Elizabeth, I will go, although she is guilty, and you, Victor, shall accompany me. I cannot go alone. The idea of this visit was torture to me, yet I could not refuse. We entered the gloomy prison chamber and beheld Justine sitting on some straw at the farther end. Her hands were manacled and her head rested on her knees. She rose on seeing us enter, and when we were left alone with her she threw herself at the feet of Elizabeth, weeping bitterly. My cousin wept also. 
Oh, Justine, said she, why did you rob me of my last consolation? I relied on your innocence, and although I was then very wretched, I was not so miserable as I am now. And do you also believe that I am so very, very wicked? asked Justine. Do you also join with my enemies to crush me, to condemn me as a murderer? Her voice was suffocated with sobs. Rise, my poor girl, said Elizabeth. Why do you kneel if you are innocent? I am not one of your enemies. I believe you guiltless, notwithstanding every evidence. Until I heard that you had yourself declared your guilt. That report, you say, is false. And be assured, dear Justine, that nothing can shake my confidence in you for a moment but your own confession. I did confess, said Justine. But I confessed a lie. I confessed that I might obtain absolution. But now that falsehood lies heavier at my heart than all my other sins. The God of heaven forgive me. Ever since I was condemned, my confessor has besieged me. He threatened and menaced until I almost began to think that I was the monster that he said I was. He threatened excommunication and hell fire in my last moments, if I continued obdurate. Dear lady, I had none to support me. All looked on me as a wretch doomed to ignominy and perdition. What could I do? In an evil hour I subscribed to a lie. And now only am I and now only am I truly miserable. She paused, weeping, and then continued. I thought with horror, my sweet lady, that you should believe your Justine, whom your blessed aunt had so highly honoured, and whom you loved was a creature capable of a crime which none but the devil himself could have perpetrated. Dear William, dear blessed child, I soon shall see you again in heaven, where we shall all be happy. And that consoles me, going as I am, to suffer ignominy and death. Oh, Justine, said Elizabeth, forgive me for having one moment distrusted you. But why did you confess... But do not mourn, dear girl, do not fear. I will proclaim, I will prove your innocence. I will melt the stony hearts of your enemies by my tears and prayers. You shall not die, you, my playfellow, my companion, my sister. Perish on the scaffold? No, no, I never could survive so horrible a misfortune. Justine shook her head mournfully. I do not fear to die, she said. That pang is past. God raises my weakness and gives me courage to endure the worst. I leave a sad and bitter world. And if you remember me and think of me as of one unjustly condemned, I am resigned to the fate awaiting me. Learn from me, dear lady, to submit in patience to the will of heaven. During this conversation I had retired to a corner of the prison room where I could conceal the horrid anguish that possessed me. Despair? Who dared talk of that, the poor victim who on the morrow was to pass the awful boundary between life and death, felt not as I did, such deep and bitter agony. I gnashed my teeth and ground them together, uttering a groan that came from my inmost soul. Justine started, and when she saw who it was, she approached me and said, Dear sir, you are very kind to visit me. You, I hope, do not believe that I am guilty? I could not answer. No, Justine, said Elizabeth, he is more convinced of your innocence than I was, for even when he heard that you had confessed, he did not credit it. I truly thank him, said Justine. In these last moments I feel the sincerest gratitude towards those who think of me with kindness. 
How sweet is the affection of others to such a wretch as I am! It removes more than half my misfortune. And I feel as if I could die in peace, now that my innocence is acknowledged by you, dear lady, and your cousin. Thus the poor sufferer tried to comfort others and herself. She indeed gained the resignation she desired. But I, the true murderer, felt the never-dying worm alive in my bosom, which allowed of no hope or consolation. Elizabeth also wept and was unhappy. But hers also was the misery of innocence, which, like a cloud that passes over the fair moon, for a while hides, but cannot tarnish its brightness. Anguish and despair had penetrated into the core of my heart. I bore a hell within me which nothing could extinguish. We stayed several hours with Justine and it was with great difficulty that Elizabeth could tear herself away. I wish, cried she, that I were to die with you. I cannot live in this world of misery. Justine assumed an air of cheerfulness while she with difficulty repressed her bitter tears. She embraced Elizabeth and said in a voice of half-suppressed emotion, Farewell, sweet lady, dearest Elizabeth my beloved and only friend. May heaven, in its bounty, bless and preserve you. May this be the last misfortune that you will ever suffer. Live and be happy and make others so. And on the morrow, Justine died. Elizabeth's heart-rending eloquence failed to move the judges from their settled conviction in the criminality of the saintly sufferer. My passionate and indignant appeals were lost upon them, and when I received their cold answers and heard the harsh, unfeeling reasoning of these men, my purposeful avowal died away on my lips. Thus I might proclaim myself a madman, but not revoke the sentence passed upon my wretched victim. She perished on the scaffold as a murderess. From the tortures of my own heart, I turned to contemplate the deep and voiceless grief of my Elizabeth. This also was my doing, and my father's woe, and the desolation of that late so smiling home. All was the work of my thrice accursed hands. Ye weep, unhappy ones, but these are not your last tears. Again shall you raise the funeral wail, and the sound of your lamentations shall again and again be heard. Frankenstein, your son, your kinsman, drop of blood. Frankenstein, your son, your kinsman, your early, much-loved friend, he who would spend each vital drop of blood for your sakes, who has no thought nor sense of joy except as it is mirrored also in your dear countenances, who would fill the air with blessings and spend his life in serving you. He bids you weep, to shed countless tears, happy beyond his hope, if thus inexorable fate be satisfied, and if the destruction pause before the peace of the grave have succeeded to your sad torments. Thus spoke my prophetic soul, as, torn by remorse, horror and despair, I beheld those I loved spend vain sorrow upon the graves of William and Justine, the first hapless victims to my unhallowed arts. And that is the end of volume one of the novel and the end of
part four. And I hope you'll join me next time for the beginning of volume two and part five of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. And in the meantime, as usual, thank you for watching and thank you for listening.